Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Catalina. I will be the host uh, of the following conversation. I'm very excited to be here today. We have a very special guest, uh, Dan Moorhead. He is the CEO and founder of Pantera Capital. Hello, Dan. How are you today? Great. Thanks, Catalina. Okay, so we have many different topics and questions to cover and a limited time. So if that's okay with you, we can jump right into it. And the first topic that I would like to cover is Bitcoin and altcoins in 2020. Because back in May this year, you said in one of your interviews that usually Bitcoin performs better than the rest of the market in times of crisis. And now that it has been, it's been four months since the crisis started, um, how do you think Bitcoin will continue performing in 2020? And do you think altcoins will start regaining market share soon? Yeah, it's a great question. And in the history of Bitcoin, there have been seven big bull and bear markets. Uh, and altcoins have been part of it for about half of those. And we've seen in a typical crisis environment, Bitcoin uh, typically massively outperforms in the early months of a crisis. Um, especially in a very steep downdraft. Uh, there's a flight to quality mentality, people trying to stay in the mega cap of the industry. And uh, smaller things are less liquid, and so if people have to sell things, they go down more. However, in history, it's taken about four months until the Bitcoin dominance, which is the share of Bitcoin as a total market share of the entire industry, has typically peaked. Uh, within four months and then gone back to normal. And we've actually just seen that. It's been about four months since this crisis started. And uh, Bitcoin dominance peaked in the middle of May, uh, went up about four percentage points. And now we're right back to where we started in early March. And it's our opinion that these altcoins and particularly smaller cap smart contract um, tokens are going to outperform Bitcoin over the next couple of years. And again, we think Bitcoin is going to go up a ton, but altcoins are going to go up even more. And, and the example is Bitcoin's up about 30% year to date, which is amazing, given that you know equities are down and you know real estate's down and almost all assets are down in price. Um, but other things in the cryptocurrency space are, are up much more. Ethereum's up 80%, uh, and then other smaller projects like Augur and Zero X are up 100% on the year. All right, excellent. I think that that is a question, a topic that a lot of a lot of people want to hear from you. And the next topic is the current crisis and pandemic. And for this, I have the following two, uh, three questions, actually. So how has venture investing in crypto particularly been affecting, affected during this crisis? Ha crisis? Has it been positive, negative, and why? Yeah, so uh, financial crises obviously kind of slow the markets down, a lot less transactions happening. But in the long, long run, it's the best time to invest. And there's a study by Cambridge Associates on the general venture markets and the return for all the vintages prior to the last financial crisis, uh, 10 years coming up to 2008, was about 6% IRR. But the six years right after the crisis were three times that, so 18% return. And we think that's going to be the same in, in the cryptocurrency venture space. Um, the crisis itself had a, a big slowdown. There have been very few transactions happening in the last three or four months. But the transactions we're seeing and we're doing, and, and we've executed about four since the pandemic started, will probably be some of the best transactions um, when we look back five or 10 years from now. Okay. And how has this economic crisis affected companies in, in your portfolio specifically? Also, do you have implemented certain business models that you didn't use to implement before? Yeah, so I, I love that question because it's, it's highlighting why Bitcoin was invented and why other cryptocurrencies exist. Satoshi Nakamoto invented Bitcoin to, as a response to the last financial crisis. Uh, there were big bailouts for banks and um, Satoshi wanted to create a currency that was essentially exempt from uh, all the you know, issues of moral hazard and, and money printing and, and would be able to function without these so-called trusted intermediaries that often fail our trust. And I think that, you know, Bitcoin uh, essentially was born in the last financial crisis, but it's going to come of age in this one and really will prove itself. And we're, we're already seeing it. The companies we're invested in 
that do cross-border money movement have seen a, a very uh, sharp increase in their volumes. Traditional money movement companies, including banks, are very difficult to access during this pandemic. Many of them have shut down their branches and made it very difficult to use. But cryptocurrencies are essentially uh, native on the internet, so they're very easy to use even in a, you know, a barrier to entry issue like this pandemic. And it's very hard to get data on that as a, as a normal investor. So we've polled our own private companies that we're invested in and created an index of seven of them that do cross-border money movement using Bitcoin. And those companies have seen an 80% increase since the end of last year. And to my mind, that's excellent proof that, you know, Bitcoin is really becoming useful and proving itself in this stressed out uh, era that we're in. Excellent. Um, are there any specific projects that you are excited um, about for 2020? Yeah, so that's one of them. We're invested in exchanges and cross-border money movement companies. Uh, for example, we're invested in a company called Bitso in Mexico, which is now doing uh, about 5% of all cross-border money movement from the, from the world back to Mexico. So, you know, it's really helping real people around the world. Um, and we're invested in about a dozen of those around the world uh, in all the different regions. Uh, and those are all, all doing very well. Another big theme for 2020 is uh, scalability, that the, the first two biggest blockchains, Bitcoin and Ethereum, do about 10 transactions per second. In order to be very useful, they have to do thousands or even hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. So we're invested in uh, six or so companies and uh, tokens that are allowing scalability. And I think in the next 12 months, you're going to see uh, those either prove themselves out uh, or, or not. And so we're, we're very excited about the scalability companies we're invested in. Okay. And last question uh, regarding the current economic crisis is, in your most recent letter, you discussed how recovery to pre-crisis real GDP may take many years to achieve. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that and, and why? Yes, um, I've spent 35 years doing global macro investing and, and thinking about global macroeconomics. And I just am, am worried that a lot of commentators and even policymakers are talking about a V-shaped recovery, that somehow, you know, this is all going to kind of go away and the economic impact will be very short-lived. Unfortunately, I think it's going to be with us for, for quite some time. And as an example, the last crisis, 2008-9 global financial crisis, which incidentally was the only uh, global recession we've had since World War II, it took three years to recover the level of GDP we had prior to the crisis. This is obviously much bigger, much steeper, and potentially ongoing, um, either the physical effects of the virus itself or the lasting psychological effects. It's, you know, it's something we haven't dealt with in 100 years. So. I think, unfortunately, that means that GDP won't recover its previous high uh, for at least four years from now. And the reason that's important for our you know, investing is that means we're going to continue to see more and more financial stimulus plans, monetary stimulus plans, all of which are going to increase the quantity of paper money, which should push up the price of things that cannot be increased like gold or cryptocurrency. Okay. Now I would like to, to focus on, on the blockchain space in particular. And you, with so many years in managing institutional, institutional capital in, in the blockchain space, how have the different avenues for blockchain exposure evolved over the years, in your opinion? Yeah, I, I like thinking back to the early days that, you know, we were the first investment firm in this space and, and we had only one fund and that fund had only one asset in it. Pantera Bitcoin fund was very simple. Uh, product and so selling that was uh, difficult. You know, asset allocators uh, want to build a diversified portfolio with lots of managers, lots of assets, and so uh, with only one manager in the space and only one fund and only one asset, that that wasn't a, a great uh, pitch for allocators. So the huge change is now there's you know half a dozen you know very reputable firms in this space. Each of those firms has three or four funds. Each of those funds has 20 or 30 assets in it. So an allocator can now build, you know, a very robust portfolio with several managers and, and tokens and venture and, you know, some things that are liquid, some things that are illiquid. Uh, and so, so now you can do that. The other big problem 
uh, when we started this industry eight years ago is custody. Custody, you know, was, uh, you know, no regulated custodians existed, you know, back then. We then invested in Zappo, which is, which was the largest custodian in, in the space and has been acquired by Coinbase. But still, there wasn't a regulated custodian out there. And now um, uh, Coinbase is, you know, highly regulated. We have uh, Fidelity, the New York Stock Exchange has, has created a company called Back that does uh, Bitcoin custody. Uh, and then you also have CME uh, and CBOE that do Bitcoin futures. So that was really the last, uh, you know, solid reason why a institutional investor could be worried about investing in this space or, or, or you know, not want to, to uh, bring this to their investment committee. But with regulated custodians now serving this space, it's very easy to, you know, make allocations. I think that's why you've seen an explosion in, um, you know, very sophisticated in investors like the major college endowments investing over the last two years. Okay. The following two, two topics, I think a lot of people they make a lot of noise in the crypto space. And I think a lot of people have certain concerns about them. So the first one is, what do you think about central bank uh, digital currencies and how could they affect the crypto market? Do you think they could serve a certain role in the industry or, or not? Yeah, that's, I think you put it very well that they're gonna serve a role, but they're not gonna take over in the entire industry. And I think there's almost a religious view in crypto that it has to be just one thing. It has to be just Bitcoin or just Ethereum or, you know, just Ripple or whatever. And I, th I think we should all get comfortable with the view. There's going to be probably about 10 really important types of tokens or cryptocurrencies in the future. Some will be very volatile like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Some will be stable coins that are pegged to um, other currencies like USDC is, is essentially pegged and backed by US dollars. And then some will be issued directly by central banks. And so they all have their different uses. And an example of why they would be very useful is in the United States, which is you know obviously supposed to be one of the most sophisticated countries on earth, it takes three hours to send Fedwire money. And so even the most sophisticated bank trying to send money across Wall Street to another sophisticated bank, uh, physically sending it 100 yards takes three hours. So a central bank cryptocurrency token would be fantastic. You could, you know, send it in a matter of seconds. Um, and so they will, I think they will be very popular, but they, they certainly aren't going to solve all of the issues. And so the uh, existing cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum will be, you know, still have their use cases, you know, uh, uh, very important. And the, the issues like central bank digital currencies or even like Fidelity's Libra project, to my mind, those are all very positive. They're bringing exposure to the cryptocurrency space and bringing potentially billions of users into cryptocurrency. And then will ultimately lead to more people using the existing cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and Ethereum, Ripple. Okay. And the other uh, topic that a lot of people have certain concerns about are regulations. You have already uh, said a lot about this topic, but uh, what are the concerns that institutions have expressed to you when considering allocations to Bitcoin or digital assets as a whole? Is there market infrastructure ready for institutional adoption? Yeah, it's, a, it's an important question, but I would say that one is pretty well behind us that, you know, six or eight years ago, the regulatory environment was very uncertain. Um, you know, we really didn't know where it would go. But now, you know, 50 million people or something have cryptocurrency. All the countries on earth have dealt with it in one way or the other. Most have been neutral. There have been a few countries like Luxembourg that are very progressive in trying to promote cryptocurrency. But most countries like the United States, you know, they don't do anything to help it, but they don't do much to hurt it. And I think the final uh, bit is sorting out the security laws, particularly in the U.S., about cryptocurrencies, um, which is kind of half done with the uh, initial coin offerings that, that have been uh, popular over the last few years. And then, you know, ultimately uh, ETF certification needs to happen. Um, so there's a few small things to be wound up, but from a institutional investor standpoint, I think we have enough clarity that it's an asset class they could invest in and that they could feel confident that, um, you know, there really aren't any uh, gating issues. And, and you hinted at one, the market infrastructure, and it's been talked about quite a bit, and, and even the chairman of the SEC has mentioned uh, supposed market manipulation in Bitcoin. 
And I, I, I personally believe that's a bit overblown. That there obviously are some exchanges, uh, particularly in Asia, that do fake trades, basically wash trades to inflate their volume and to, to make it look like they're more popular than they are and to, to push their, um, their exchange up in the league tables. But if you're talking about regulated exchanges like you know, Coinbase or Bitstamp or uh, you know, the CME, you know, there's no fake volume going through those. And, and there's, you know, often kind of mythical tales in the industry about Bitcoin whales that are controlling the price and pushing it around. And to my mind, that's ludicrous. The the market's worth $300 billion. There's nobody uh, that's big enough to push around a $300 billion market. How do you expect the, the crypto space to, to evolve in the following three, five years. And this is another question um, that I personally have. Where do you think we need to evolve uh, the most? It could be on a technical level or on any other factor. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, I, I'd like to remind people that, you know, big disruptions don't happen overnight. And um, it's very popular to say the internet took 20 years to happen and to go from Uh, you know, kind of the primordial, you know, email type stuff to, you know, Uber and, and um, other more useful applications. But the reality is it actually took 20 years for TCP IP to just even get to the browser, right? And then it took another 20 years to get to where we are today. And so, you know, technology does take a while. Uh, Bitcoin's 11 years old, so it's, you know, it's been, been around for a while, but we still need uh, scalability issues that I mentioned before to make it very, very useful. Um, I think that over the next few years, you're going to see uh, most of the major blockchain scale, you know, either on-chain or some kind of off-chain uh, way to scale. And that's the remaining technical issue is to be able to uh, do more than 10 transactions per second. And there are some blockchains that already do, you know, uh, thousands of transactions per second. Uh, and there are new blockchains coming out like Polkadot and others that, that will allow much more transaction flow. So that has to be proved out, but the rest of the building blocks are essentially there. And that's why you're seeing an uptick in usage. That's why you're seeing you know, more institutions investing in the space. Okay, um, so we started the conversation uh, with Bitcoin in 2020. Now to sum up, I would like to, to talk about some price predictions that you did in the past. So. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your 115K stock to flow analysis prediction that you made in the previous months. Yeah, so uh, Bitcoin has a, a, a unique feature in the money supply being defined and you know exactly what it's going to be. Uh, very different than the Federal Reserve or any other you know, kind of paper money system. And uh, the formula is the original days, 50 Bitcoin were issued every 10 minutes. And then every four years, that number is cut in half until ultimately 100 years from now where there's no more Bitcoin issued. Uh, and so we've had two times where the number of Bitcoin is cut in half. And as you would imagine from the law of supply and demand, that if you cut the supply of something by 50%, it, with constant demand, it probably goes up in price. And we've seen that in the first two halvings. Uh, the first one, um, they were cutting out uh, half of the supply when the a stock that was outstanding was actually relatively low. There's about 10 million Bitcoins outstanding when it was cut. And so over the next uh, 440 days, which is a, a period that's important for halvings, that cut about 15% of the uh, total stock out of the new supply. And so it had a big impact on the prices. Prices went up 9,000%. So four years later, the halving was of course half as big. So, you know, it was a less impact. And then the amount of Bitcoin outstanding was much more. There was Uh, about 15 million Bitcoin outstanding in the um, halving in 2016. So that cut out about 5% of the total outstanding stock. And uh, it, the impact in the markets was out about exactly a third as big as the previous one. So the halving that we are going through right now uh, cuts out um, about 2% of the outstanding stock. So it's about a third as big as the um, previous one. And if these ratios Uh, repeat themselves, which obviously history doesn't have to repeat itself, but it often rhymes. That would mean that uh, the price of Bitcoin would go up about 10x over the next uh, year and a half. And 
I'm not saying that's my, you know, bet your entire life savings on Bitcoin achieving exactly 115,000, but I do think it's a very high likelihood that Bitcoin goes up a huge amount in the next 18 months. We, in addition to the halving, we have obviously the global macro stuff that we talked about earlier. You have all these institutional investors coming into the space. Uh, and then Bitcoin's still at less than half of its previous peak. So it's, it's not like it's exp expensive yet. We think it's actually uh, very, very cheap to its long-term trend regression. So all those factors combined uh, make us as bullish as we've been in many, many years. All right. Well, we have covered all, all the topic, topics that we had on the agenda. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Moorhead, uh, for being here. It was very nice to meet you. And yeah, we hope you enjoyed this as much as we did. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Kelly.